All right, I think we should be live now. So this is going to be lecture 19. And there are a few announcements, obviously, that uh, need to be made. So first off, um, you still have an assignment eight and you still have an assignment nine, although assignment nine has been significantly shortened. So please do make sure that you've gotten a head start on those. The deadline for assignment eight and assignment nine are actually very, very close together. Uh, a few other things to say, we will still be holding office hours, but they're going to be mostly done through a discord server. And the link to that's going to be posted on Piazza. If you need help with your code, the best thing that you can do is make a private Piazza post and we will do our best to get to that as quickly as we can. Uh, assignment nine again is very, very short and hopefully you'll all have a lot of fun with that. Um, another announcement to make is your final exam, which we're not allowed to call an exam. We have two possible grading schemes that you can use. The first is going to take the weight from the midterm participation marks and the assignments you've done so far. And the section, second option is going to take all of the things that you've done so far and there is a final assessment that is worth 25% and we will give you the maximum of the two scores. So option one, if that gives you 78 and option two, should you choose to do the final assessment, if that gives you an 81, then you would get an 81. So it's the maximum of the two. Now, what is the final assessment going to look like? Um, you will have 10 days to complete it and we'll post more details on this shortly. Um, but it should be comprised of two components. One of them is going to be an online quiz through Learn, and it's open book, and uh, it won't be timed either. Um, and then the major component of the assessment is actually going to be a little coding problem, and it will be submitted like any other assignment that you've ever done. So nothing, nothing unusual there. All right, that's all I can remember. So then, I know it's been a good week and I hope everybody has found a safe place to sit at home and enjoy the sunshine that hopefully comes out later today. Um, so let's go and do some review then. Let's flip over here. So I know we don't have clickers or anything like that, but we left off last class talking about unnamed functions. Because if we wanted to create a function that produced another function, we were using this kind of Henderson local syntax, which wasn't very nice. And um, well, as it turns out, there was an easier way to do that just by doing this lambda or unnamed function syntax. So what I have here is a small stepping problem. We've got an unnamed function Lambda takes two arguments, x, y, and it's going to multiply the x components and add them to the multiplied y components. And then we've applied arguments two and three to this function here. So what we want to do is actually trace the steps. Now, I don't have this line by line, but I'll kind of walk you through where we go with this. So first off, when you see a lambda, it's very tempting to think there's all these extra steps that you need to do in order to use it. But actually, it's not. It's just a function. It just doesn't have a name. So what we're going to do is, since what you can see here is the arguments that were supplied to the lambda are values, then we're just going to take them directly and substitute them into the body of the lambda function. So we substitute x for 2 and 3 for y. And then we're just going to get rid of the lambda syntax. So now you're just left with the body of the lambda there. And then we just fill it out as we normally would. So we start with the leftmost argument of the add, which is two times two. So we'll evaluate that to four. And then in the next step, we'll evaluate three times three. So you end up with nine plus four, which gives you, of course, 13. All right. So 
I know, again, we don't have clickers, so obviously you can't click in because that doesn't work like that, but I thought it would still be fun to have uh, a few little sample problems to refresh where we were. And we were talking before Lambda, we were talking about this filter function. And filter is a built-in abstract list function. And of course, the, its purpose is to take a list and what it's going to do is for each element in the consumed list where the function produces true, we're going to keep it and we're going to throw away everything else. So we have here, instead of passing in a named function, we've decided to use a lambda. And so this lambda here has checks if the argument squared is even. And if that evaluates to true, then of course we're going to keep the element. And then the list we've passed in is the numbers 1 through 10. Okay, so looking at the first option here, we're saying that filter all of those that have even squares, um, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And that's simply not the case because we know that 3 times 3 is 9 and 9 is not even, so it's not A. And we also know it's not b because again, 3 squared is 9, which is also not even. So the question is, is it c or d or e? Well, if I look at these numbers here, 2 squared is 4, 4 squared is 16, 6 squared is 36, and then we've got 64 and 100. So all of the options in c would be even, which means that's our list. Whereas in D, 6 and 10 should be there and aren't. So the answer to this one is actually C. And of course, if you're sitting there at home with Dr. Racket, you could, of course, just copy and paste that into Dr. Racket. I know the answer. And of course, since your exam will not be on paper, you will have access to Dr. Racket. So for anything that you need, just open up Dr. Racket and find the answer. I want to apologize in advance if you hear any screaming or crazy laughter. My kids are underneath me playing in the basement, so it could be a little rowdy. All right, so then, our next one is looking at which of the following is a valid method to bind a function to a name. Now, if you remember, we've shown you a few ways now that you can actually create a named function. And the way that you've done it the entire term is option A. So you have define, and then in the brackets, you put the function name followed by a list of our arguments. And then in the dot, dot, dot would be your function body. So obviously A is valid. Now, another one that we've done a few days ago was this one here, number C, where we are defining the constant fun to be equal to the result of this local. And this local, if you look at it, actually creates an anonymous function uh, of three arguments. So fun is bound to this anonymous function. This is also completely valid. Then of course, lambda, which creates an unnamed function. Well, since functions are first class values, we can indeed bind a name such as fun to the lambda. So the answer for this one, of course, is going to be all of the above. So then, that is all of the review problems for today. Um, so let's go over to looking at your slides then, which you probably don't remember where we left off and that's totally fine. So let me find my mouse here and let's go over to, there we go. All right, so what we've got with this here is we are on uh, module 14, slide 13. We were looking at anonymous functions. And just to go back a little bit, we had shown you how indeed you could take a function like interest earned. This is how we originally defined it. And remember that this is just syntactic sugar that Dr. Racket does for you. Um, it's actually going to take your function definition like this, and it actually converts it 
to this translation down here where we're binding the name interest earned to the unnamed function uh, land amount is multiplying interest rate by amount. You do not have to take that into consideration when you're doing stepping so long as the function is presented at the original way that's highlighted here. Um, however, if we present the function to you in the correct way, where we are binding a constant to the unnamed function, then you will need to take into consideration that there's an extra step involved with the actual substitution. Okay. So we, uh, another example of tracing through with lambdas here, if you remember we had this little function factory called make adder. In make adder we used some rather ugly little locals to produce a function that added a number to whatever you gave to it. So if I call make adder three, it would create a function that would add three to whatever number you've passed to it. Now we've taken that rather ugly local syntax and we've converted that to the traditional lambda form. And you can see here, it actually looks quite tidy. Maybe we could have done a little bit better with the naming of the arguments, but that's always something we could argue with. Uh, lambda functions. And now we are trying to evaluate make adder 3 and applying 4 to that. So let's just go through the steps here. So we start off with this is our constant definition. We are binding the name make adder to the unnamed function lambda x with the body of the outer anonymous function being uh, another function itself. Okay. So this is our line here that we actually want to evaluate, make adder 3. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to substitute make adder for what it is bound to. So you'll see here we've replaced make adder with the lambda expression right there. Okay, well, now it's just a regular function and it's being applied to a value. So we're just going to do what we've always done, which is we're going to substitute 3 in for x everywhere in the body of our exterior function. And now we are left with lambda y is adding 3 to y. And again, here we have 4, a value, being applied to our function. And so we're just going to substitute the 4 in for the y, dropping the lambda syntax, and then 3 plus 4, of course, is 7. So when you see the functions in this format here, where we are actually binding an identifier, to the lambda, you actually have to do one extra step and that is to substitute the identifier for what it's actually bound to. But other than that, it's very straightforward. There's no additional steps that you need to consider. No new rules for lambda. Okay. So we're going to skip a few slides here. And that's actually something I want to make mention here before I actually forget about it. Um, we only actually have four lectures left, including today's. And technically speaking, there should have been six lectures of content. So we are not allowed just to give you six makeup lectures. We were actually instructed by the university that we had to remove an entire week's worth of content. So two lectures are being dropped. So we're going to be skipping through some content rather quickly. And we're also going to be dropping some content. So unfortunately, the sacrificial lamb is going to be the history module at the very end. Uh, as much as I like computing history, if I look at what is going to put you in the best position moving forward to either a co-op position or to just the future of your CS degrees or just computing in general, knowing who Alan Turing is is important, but it's not going to help you learn how to program. Um, if you're interested, by all means, please do read the module on your own, but we're going to be skipping it. And we're also going to be skipping another, a number of other slides. Okay, back to the substitution rules for lambda. So if you were curious about what the formal substitution rule for lambda is, this is what it is right here. We have lambda x1 to xn, those are the arguments for lambda. And then the body of the lambda is the expression and then we are applying to that function a number of arguments, which are values here, and it's going to produce some expression. Now, some things to keep in mind is that you can have lambdas inside of lambdas. You can have lambdas inside of locals. You can have locals inside of lambdas. So there's all kinds of wonky things that you could do here. And it may seem very crazy, but it's actually a very powerful thing. 
And if you're sitting there wondering, why do I need these lambdas other than tidying up a bunch of locals? There is a reason for that. Um, one of those reasons is a lot of the time when we're doing something like these filter functions, which I'm not sure we actually have any in this list. Oh, here we go. So when we're doing these filter functions, we created a predicate that was specifically used to determine is this thing an apple or not? That function isn't useful elsewhere. And we tried to hide that with this local, but it still required us to create that name. But the name at the end of the day wasn't really important because it was used a single time. So why bother even finding a name? The Lambda lets us represent a single use function. We're only using it once for this very specific case. There's no reason to assign a name to it. Now, when should you use a Lambda versus actually creating a local helper or whether you wanna create a top level helper? Things to consider is, is it conceivable that somebody else might want to use this function I'm creating? If it is conceivable that somebody might be using this function you're creating at a top level, then you should create a top level helper. If the function you're using, it's conceivable that that function may be used multiple times within the body of that function, maybe you wanna create a local definition. But if truly nobody else is going to use this other than you, you should use a Lambda. All right. And by the way, you're allowed to use Lambdas on assignment nine. In fact, we expect you to do it appropriately. All right. So there's quite a few slides here that are discussing this character transformation in strings. And I want to tell you in advance, we're actually going to skip these slides. Um, this is kind of a Caesar cipher, which is where you're going to take a character and you're going to apply a transformation to it to create another character. Think of it as a kind of encoding. Um, these slides are actually numbered. Let me see my list here. They are numbers 19 through 25. And I encourage you to read those on your own because it's a good example, but we're not gonna go through it here because it's a little dry. So let's skip ahead then to slide 26. Because I'd like to show you something a little bit more useful, a little bit more interesting. So first off, we've covered filter. And it's very clear that filter is a valuable function because we are often trying to remove elements from a list. For example, if I have a list of all the students in the class, maybe I want to know who in this class is actually registered in CS, and I want to filter the list by that. And I can then use that same filter abstract list function. Maybe I just want to get everybody in the class who has a score greater than 70%. That one abstract list function is super useful with selecting certain elements from a list and giving me those that match that criteria. But sometimes I want to do other things with lists. So we've got two functions here on this slide. It's number 26. And the first one is I have a list of numbers. Of course, they haven't put a contract here. So it's a list of numbers. And what I want to do is I want to negate everything in that list. That is, I want to multiply everything by negative one. And if I take you back in time to the template or the data definition for a list of numbers, you'll remember that a list of numbers is either empty or we are cleansing a number onto a list of numbers. And we created a template function based off that data definition where if the list was empty, we did something. Otherwise, we do something with the first element and we combine that with the results of doing something with the rest of the list. And if you look at this negate list, and that's the simple recursive deadline, if you look at this negate list function here, it has the same format as our simple recursive template. If the list is empty, we produce empty because we want to produce a negated list, so we are producing a list. If the list is not empty, then I am going to cons, and this is coming right from the data definition, I'm cleansing the negated first of the list onto the results I get from negating the rest of the list. So this matches both our data definition and our template exactly. Okay. So that very simple function here at the top, that is actually going to negate every number in your list. So here's another function below it, it's called compute taxes. 
And compute taxes is actually another function that is simply recursive. Now you may not remember what this SR to TR function is, but it's going to actually uh, compute the, the taxes for each of the members on our payroll. So again, we are applying a function to each element of my list and producing a new list. So if my list of payroll is empty, I produce empty. And if it's not empty, I'm going to compute the taxes for the current employee and cons their tax record onto the results of computing the taxes for the remaining employees. Now, if you look at these two functions here, what you'll see is that they follow the same data definition. They follow the same simple recursive template. There is only a teeny tiny difference between these two functions. In negate list, we negated the first element. In compute taxes, I'm computing how much money this person has to pay for taxes. So the function that I apply to the first element of the list is different, but how I relate that result to the result of computing whatever in the rest of the list is the same. Now, are there other functions that would look the same as these? Well, let's suppose I wanted to say compute the final grades for this course. So I have a list of students and in that list of students, I also have a special function that I'm going to use to compute your weighted final average. And then of course, now that we have two marking schemes, we'll take the maximum of both. And I want to produce a new list so I can upload it to Quest and that's going to be everybody's submitted grades. So I take a list of students, and in that list I have all of your assignment grades, your midterm grade, your participation grade, and your final assessment grade. So if the list of students is empty, I produce empty. If the list of students is not empty, I'm going to take the first student in my list, I'm going to compute their final grade, and then I'm going to cleanse that onto the result I get of computing the grades for the remaining students in the list. That looks identical to the two functions that are on this slide. And if I wanted to do the Caesar cipher, which is where I'm going to transform characters from, say, uppercase to lowercase, where I have a list of characters, well, I would be doing the exact same thing. I am applying a function to each element of the list and producing a new list in return. And, well, if you look at these, they're the same, aren't they? They're, all of these functions are identical. And we could abstract what these functions are doing into a function we're going to call temporarily my map. And what my map is going to do is it follows that simple recursive template in the data definition, and it's going to parameterize the function we apply to each element in the list. So if you look at my map here, F is the function I want to apply to the elements in the list. And then we have the list, which is what I'm going to apply F to. And then Comparing compute taxes to my map, you'll see that if we're empty, we still produce empty. Otherwise, we cons applying the function f onto the first of the list and consing that onto the results of applying my map to the rest of the list. There we go. We've just abstracted all of those functions into a single one called my map. And we could trace through this. So here you go. Let's say square every number in the list. So I'm going to take my map, I apply the square function, that's what I want to apply to each element in the list, and I pass into, into map my list 365. So what it's going to do is we're going to first, and remember this is a condensed trace, so there are many steps missing, and we would still anticipate that you do know how to step through this completely. So in my first step, since the list was not empty, I end up consing squared three onto the results of calling square on the rest of the list. So I've got cons nine onto my map, square, and the rest of the list is list six, five. And then in the second big step, we have cons nine, cons 36 onto my map of square list five. And then we get cons 9, cons 36, cons 25, onto my map square empty. So we are stripping off elements of the list one by one. And now in this final step, you'll see since the list is empty, it produces empty. And we have produced a new list where each of the elements have actually been squared. So there you go. Now, 
I'm going to skip slide 29 because I don't find it particularly interesting. We can now take this MyMap function and that negate list and compute taxes and the Caesar cipher and all of these other functions, we can now implement them in a single line with MyMap. So negate list is, has gone from like four lines to one line and compute taxes has gone from four lines to one line. And that is absolutely beautiful. And in fact, map is probably my favorite function of all. So the next question we have to ask is what is the template? Or not the template, what is the contract for my map? So we're gonna open up Dr. Racket here and we'll just talk about the contract for my map. So we have this function my map. I'll type it down in here. And uh, it's going to take some function. And I don't like to use F, I like to use FN for function. And what we're going to do is the function is empty. Otherwise, there. So there's our mind map function. So let's think about the contract for this. So this list here could contain, well, anything, which means that my function here also needs to be able to consume anything. And we don't know what that function is going to do. That function could take a number and it can turn it into a string. For example, I could take a list that's the number one, the number two, the number three, and turn it into the strings for one, two, three, four spelled out. So the function, this one here, we know that it a, consumes a single thing and it produces a single thing and it could consume anything and it could produce anything. But that's not, so it's very tempting to believe that my maps contract looks like this. So we could do my map any, remember how to do contracts. For functions here, you actually are going to put the contract of the function as the type of that argument. So I could do this. But this isn't particularly descriptive or useful. Because some of the functions that I could put here, well, this technically the contractor that I've given, I could provide a list of numbers. And I could call um, something like first could be my function. And that wouldn't work. And my map would produce an error because when it's doing its dynamic type checking, as it's actually being evaluated, we would know that the elements of my list of numbers are not lists. And so we can't actually apply first to that. So what we've noticed here then is that whatever the lists type is, has to be the same type as what's consumed by the function we supplied a map. So we're gonna parameterize this. So list of x, and our function is going to consume x. Now it's very tempting then to say, okay, well then it produces any and a list of any. Okay, but not quite accurate. Then you might be thinking, okay, well can't I replace any with x? Again, no. Because I could be transforming numbers into lists, or I could transform a list into a string. So seeing x to x doesn't quite capture. So what we might do instead is say, add another parameterized type. So my map takes a function that consumes something of type x and produces something of type y. Now what's interesting is y could equal x and y could equal any, and that's perfectly valid, but we've captured that ability within those parameterizations. And then we also consume a list of x. So we've got the x in our list matching the type that our function consumes. And again, it can be any, if that's what our list and our function support. And if it isn't that, then we've captured the fact that, hey, this is a list of numbers, and this can only consume functions that work on numbers. And then the last thing we need to do is since our function produces things of type y, that means we're producing a list of type y. And again, y can be any, y can be x, or y could be something else. So there we have a lovely little contract for my map.
which is great, right? Okay. So let's go back here. And um, let's just talk about my map for a little bit. So first off, my map is actually built in. And it's not, of course, called my map. It's called map. So if we wanted to, say, negate a list, what we would do instead is we would just call map, pass, negate, and here's our list of numbers. There we go. We've negated the list. Or if I wanted to, say, um, get the first element of each thing in the list, I can say first, and yes, this is very silly, but why not? There we go. So map is actually a built-in function. And map is actually a super useful function. It's super valuable. Uh, this is not a function which is unique to Rocky. Uh, in fact, map actually is a function that many of you have heard of in the context of something called MapReduce or Hadoop. And this is, well, to tell you what map does, it's applying a function to the same function to a bunch of pieces of data. And uh, MapReduce actually does that. The map part of MapReduce takes a function and it's going to apply that function to each of the pieces of data that you have. Now you might be wondering, why is this so useful? I have loops, I have recursion, I don't see the value of this. Okay, fair enough. Maybe map doesn't seem that interesting to you. But step outside of Racket for a while. And yes, it is an abstract function. So it's still quite useful in simplifying code and making it pretty and abstract. But here's the real power of map. Step outside of Racket and give yourself the ability to run code in parallel. That's where map's power lies. There's nothing about map that says I have to produce the list in sequential order, that is one element at a time. What map does in the real world in things like MapReduce is we are going to create a new process or a new thread for each piece of data and then we apply our function in parallel to each piece of data. So you go from con consuming and working with the list one element at a time so you've got a list of 100 things, and they're all computed at the same time. And since you're going in parallel, you're going to improve the performance of things by orders of magnitude. So map is actually something that we use in the real world all the time, and it's very, very powerful. And if you're curious to ever play with MapReduce, um, both Amazon and Google and Microsoft, there are a number of places that actually have MapReduce servers, which you can either rent time on or many of these places actually offer a free time on if you're willing to use some of their lower powered machines. And if you're wondering what are some of the cool things you can do with MapReduce in the real world, I have actually done um, ray tracing with MapReduce and it's, it's pretty cool how you do it. All right. So let's let me find my mouse here. Let's then go back to the slides and we're going to skip 32 and we're going to go to slide 33. So we've done the map part and we've got filter. So we have the ability to sort through a list and extract certain elements. We have the ability through an abstract list function to apply the same function to each element of the list but we're still missing some things. In particular, one of the other things that we did with lists was things like we give a list of numbers and we want to know what is the sum of that list of numbers. Or I want to know how many students in this room are enrolled in this mystical mystery thing called geomatics, which I have no idea what it is. So I want to, instead of producing a new list, I want to count or sum. I want to take my list and I want to produce a singular result. So let's look at a few functions here. And they're all going to follow the same template. And it is still the simple recursive template. But instead of producing a list, 
we're going to produce a singular value. So what we've got here is some numbers. Very simple function. It takes a list of numbers. And if the list is empty, our base case is zero because I'm summing all of the numbers in my list. So the base case, of course, is going to be zero. I want, when I'm at the end of the list, I add zero because that effectually does nothing. Otherwise, I'm going to add the first of the list to the result of summing the rest of the list. Follows our data definition, follows our template, very, very simply, except we're not producing a list. Okay? Now, here's function product of numbers. So this is very, very simple to sum, sum of numbers, except instead of adding them all, we're going to multiply them all together. For example, you could actually use product of numbers to actually implement a factorial. If your list was 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that would be effectively 6 factorial. So our base case in product of numbers is not zero, because if I multiply zero by anything, I get zero. So that, that would be really bad. Instead, what we are going to do is we are going to set our base case to 1. And with a base case of 1, that means if I multiply 1 by anything, of course, I get the results. So that's a perfect base case. Then, of course, if we are not an empty list, we are going to this time multiply the first of the list by the result of multiplying the numbers from the rest of the list. And as you can see here, sum of numbers looks almost identical to product of numbers. The only difference is what is the base case and what is the function I am using to combine this element with the results from the rest of the list. So different function, different base case. Keep that in mind as we're going through these different things. Actually, I'm going to adjust my chair here because it looks like I'm sitting on the floor and I'm not. There we go. That's not what I All right, so the next function is all true. So in this function, I want to take a list of things and I want to know do all of the things in my list, are they all true? So if my list is empty, it contains no items which means that everything in my empty list is true because there's nothing there. So my base case in all true is going to be producing true. Otherwise, I need to check the first element and combine that in some way with the results of checking if the rest of the list is all true. And how I'm going to do that is use and. So I'm going to check if the first of the list and the results of computing the rest of the list are true. Now, why does this work to use AND? Because AND is going to produce false immediately if the argument it's evaluating is false. So I'm going to say AND first of the list. And so I'm going to get AND element AND element AND element true. And when we actually work stepping through this, we'll see if any one of those is false, then the whole thing we just did produced false. But even though that may seem a little weird, if you actually compare all true to the other two functions we have, we have a different base case. This case is true. But again, we are using some function to combine the first element of the list with the results of the rest of the list. So these three functions here are actually all the same thing. Okay, so let's go back and look at our list template. What you'll see here is in our list template, if the list is empty, do something. Otherwise, combine in some way the first of the list with the results of processing the rest of the list. If you're wondering what that weird racket was, that was my son running around with an alligator. A toy. All right. So what we see here in this list template is, well, what we saw back here with sum of numbers and product numbers. We have some base case, and then we are using some function to combine the first of the list with calling the function on the rest of the list. So these three functions all follow this list template here, which means we should be able to write an abstract list function for this. And that's great. 
Now, we're going to call this abstract list function that's built in my fold R. That's our name for it. And it's different from the abstract list functions you've seen so far. So filter and map consumed only two arguments. Filter consumes a function and a list, and map consumed a function and a list. But that's not enough for this one because we not only need to parameterize the function we are applying to combine the first element with the results of the rest, we also need to provide the base case because the base case is specific to whatever task we are doing. So for example, in summing the numbers, the base case was zero. In multiplying the numbers, the base case is one. So we've got to parameterize both the function and the base case. Another thing to point out is the function we are using to combine the first element with the rest, instead of taking a single argument, is now going to take two arguments. That is the first of the list and the results of the rest of the list. So it's a function that takes two things now instead of one. So in my fold R, we have our function to combine. We have our base case. And we have our list. And then the actual implementation of my folder is very simple. If you go back to this list template, we've just added two arguments and filled in the dot, dot, dots. So when the list is empty, produce the base case. Otherwise, use the function to combine the first of the list with the results of calling my folder on the rest of the list. And that's it. Now you have this function called my full R, and it can be used to take a list and turn it into a singular value. Now, this full R would be known to most people as the reduce operation. So you would do something like, let's call map, where we want to count how many times the word the occurs in every single Wikipedia article. And then we would call fold R as a reduce operation to take all the sums of how many times the is used in every article and find out how many times the word the is used in all of Wikipedia. So map, and we parallelize it, and then we reduce. We take all of the workers' responses and produce one final answer. So my fold R is Rackett's version of a reduce operation. And this is probably the single most useful function in Racket, my fold R that is. And well, in Racket it's called fold R and it's built in. So some examples of actually using it here. We have uh, my fold R and I'm applying, this is not a particular function, this is just function F and let's say our base case is zero and we have a list three, six, five. Now we're not going to take it where we're actually applying f to each element. We just want to show you how the trace looks so that you can kind of see how this is being put together. So the first iteration, we are applying f to the first of the list. So we have f of 3. So we're combining using function f 3 with the results of calling my fold r on the list 6, 5. On the second call, we have we are combining f of 3 with the results of combining f 6 with the results of my full R on the list 5. In the third recursive step, you'll see we are now combining 5 using function f with the results of my full R empty. So now what we've got is when my full R empty is evaluated, we produce the base case, and there it is there highlighted. And then we are going to combine using function f, 5 with 0. And that's going to evaluate to something. And then we end up applying f to 6 and the results of 5 and 0. And then we'll combine 3 with the results of f. So it's pretty neat. All right. Now. Again, I'm going to slip, skip slide 39 because I don't find it particularly interesting, but you're welcome to look at it. It's just another way of looking at how fold R is actually working. So why is it called fold R? It's called fold R because it stands for fold right. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking a list and some function and we're reducing it 
starting from the right. So when we think of taking, you know, the sum of the numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, we always think about doing that from the left. And by the way, there is a fold L for fold left in bracket, and we'll cover it next class. But for, for now, we're going to cover fold right. So here's what I mean by that. If you have, just going to use racket here as my scrap space. So let's say you're adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Okay. That's the list that you're signing. When we as humans see the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, we would do 1 plus 2, and then that plus 3, and then that plus 4, and then that plus 5. That's folding from the left. We are taking this and folding it that way. Fold R goes the opposite direction. Instead of doing the summation from the left, we're doing the summation from the right. So let me show you here in racket exactly what I mean by that we would be summing like this. And now we've got 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 9. And then in the next one, we have 1 plus 2 plus 12. And then we have 1 plus 14. And then we get 15. So we have folded this from the right. And if you think about this, this is the simple recursion that you've been doing the entire term. So it's kind of weird to think about because it's the opposite to what we think of things being evaluated, but this is just how the simple recursion is evaluated the entire term. It's just following the list template. All right. So an interesting thing that you'll see on this slide here, this is slide 40, is that it states that uh, fold R can be used to implement map and filter and all of the other list functions. And that is completely true. Because what's interesting about fold R is you may believe now that fold R can only be used to do something like, oh, let's um, sum a list or let's compute, count how many students are undergrads in this class, or let's count how many students are going to get 100% in this class. So you're thinking of taking a list and turning it into a single value, a single value, not a list. But you can actually use full R to make a list. You really can. And because you can use full R to make a list, you can use it to make map and filter. So what I'd actually like to do is I'd like to show you the implementations of map and filter using fold R so you can see it. And then a little bit later, we'll actually come back and talk about why it works and how it works. So I'm going to go back over to Racket, and I already have them implemented here. So here we have at the top, this is fold R map. So it's going to consume two things a function, and a list. Now we know that map consumes a function and a list. So the one thing, and it produces a list. So the fold R requires a base case. Well, map consumes a list and produces a list, which means it also, our base case is already known to us. It's empty. And we'll talk a bit more about how that works in a bit. But there we go, we have our function being applied to each element of the list. Now we have filter. Filter takes a list and a predicate, and it produces a new list where that predicate would evaluate to true. So again, our base case for here is already known because it's empty. We're producing a list, and the base case for a list is empty. Now this one looks a little bit more complicated than map, but it's still fairly straightforward. And again, we'll come back to this uh, in a few minutes. So there you go, map and filter implemented with fold R. So let's go back here. All right. So before we look at how map and filter were actually implemented with fold R in greater detail, and before we look at, okay, so maybe how do we produce a list from fold R? We should consider what is the contract for fold R. So let's think about the contract for full R. And let's actually do it in the context. Um, we'll just, let's just do it over here. So 
foldr takes a function. So here's, well, let's just do our my full r here. So here's my full r. So we have a function, and then we have a base and a list. And then we are going to, the list is empty, produce the base case. Otherwise, we are going to apply the function to the first of the list, and then we call my fold r. Let's see if I can spell here on the rest of the list. So there's my fold R, because we're going to use this here for developing our contract. Okay, so the function is going to consume two arguments and produce one. So our function to my fold R, you might be thinking any, any produces any. And then we have a base case, which could be any. And then this whole thing is going to, uh, sorry, I guess we need a list of any. And it produces something. Okay. What's this going to be? Well, let's for now say any. Okay. We're running into the same problem that we had before. The list of things that we consume, we're saying any, and the function that we're consuming is taking any. Now keep in mind this first argument here. This one is from, this is the first of the list. And the second argument going into this is the result of rest of list. Okay. So the first any and the list of any should be a parameterized type because whatever function we're applying to the first of the list, that function has to match the type. So let's switch this around. Let's switch the first any to x and the list of any to x. Okay, so now we've got that matching. Now, what do we do with the base case and the second argument to the function we're consuming? It's a good question. What do we do with that? Well, what we could do is we note that my fold R doesn't necessarily have to take a list of numbers and produce a number. It could take a list of numbers and produce a string. So the base case may be a completely different type. So we're also going to parameterize the base case using Y. And remember that Y can technically be a different type from X or it could be the same thing, which means that our second argument here should also be Y. This leads us to an interesting problem. We have a function that is going to take something of type x and something of type y and produce something else. Well, we are combining the first of the list with the results from the rest of the list, which means that the rest of the list is going to produce something of type y as well. And then this part here could be a Y. And I'm going to leave that for you to think about. Should it be a Y? Should it be a Z? Should it be a list of Y? What should that remaining part of the my folder contract actually be? All right. So there's an exercise for you to think about. So let's then go back to our lovely slides here. And what I want to look at then is actually using Foldr. So you've seen kind of how we built up Foldr. How do we actually use Foldr now? Okay, so simple ways of using Foldr. We take that sum of numbers, and you'll see here that it's just Foldr, and our function is add. Our base case is zero, and we pass the list into it. One line, done, it's beautiful. If you want to do product of numbers, then you would pass multiply and the base case of one. If you wanted to do all true, the function you pass is and, and the base case is true. Very, very simple to take those complicated functions and turn them into one-liners, so it's great. But I don't 
want to do that that way. Maybe I want to use fold R to count the number of things in my list. That's an interesting thing to do. So what's interesting about counting the number of things in the list, so what I'm talking about is how do you implement length with fold R? Well, to implement length with fold R, let's first look at the length function. So we're saying count symbols here, but really this is just how many symbols are in a list of symbols. So what we note is that if the list is empty, there are no items in the list, so we produce zero. How then do we count the number of things in the list? We don't actually care about what the elements in the list are because we're just counting how many there are. So instead of using some function applied to the first of the list, I just want to make note of, oh, it's there. I don't care what the first of the list is, I'm just making note of it, that it's there. So what you see in this count symbols is instead of looking at what the first of the list is, we simply add one, where the one is, I'm making note, I have an element of the list. So I add one to however many things are in the rest of the list. So what's interesting about this is that the function I'm applying completely ignores the element of the list. And you might be thinking you can't implement this with fold R, but you totally can. Um, so what you do is you have count symbols. Where's my mouse here? Okay. So I create this lambda function. And you'll notice that there's no con, there's nothing like that. I replace it. So what I'm doing is I'm just calling add one. Why does this work? I completely ignore argument x. I ignore argument x because I don't care what it is. I just want to make note that it's here. And that's what add one does. Add one is essentially saying, I recognize this is an element. I don't care what the element is. I'm just making note it is here. I am adding one then to the results of counting how many items are in the rest of the list. So it's entirely possible to use full R with a function where that first argument, which is what would be the first of the list, is completely ignored, and that's perfectly valid. So this here, this count symbols, is effectively implementing length with fold R. Fold R is a very, very, very powerful function indeed. All right, so. Here we have a bunch of functions, um, and they are all implemented with fold R. And this is something, by the way, we'd love to ask you to do. And if we were to actually look at what kinds of questions should you anticipate on your learn-based quiz, we might give you some functions and ask you what they do. Give us the answer. So we have this function bar that it consumes a list of numbers, and then it calls a fold R, and the function we pass the fold R is max. Our base case is the first of the list, and then we're going to pass the rest of the list into our list of numbers. So what does function bar do? Well, let's think about it this way. So I have some function, and um, I call full R, and my base case is the first of the list, so it's gonna be one. So in my first call to full R, I am going to compute the max of five and the rest of the list, okay? So I've got max five, full bar max, the rest of the list. From the second recursive call to my full bar, I would get max 23. And then max three, max 99, max two, and finally, the max of two and our base case, which would be one. So max of two and one would give us two. Max of 99 and two gives us 99. Max of three and 99 gives us 99. Max of 23 and 99 gives us 99. Max of five and 99 gives us 99. We are evaluating from the right to the left. It's pretty cool. So that function there, bar, is going to compute 
the maximum of our list. So that's pretty cool. Okay, what about this second function? So we have this function foo, and instead of using a nice named function, we've got a lambda here, because you know we want to obscure it even more from you. And um, our base case is going to be zero in our full bar, and we pass in a list of strings. And inside our lambda function, we are going to add the string length of the first of the list to the results we get of calling my full bar on the rest of the list. Okay. So let's, I'm going to copy and paste this over into bracket here just to show you what actually happens with this one. Oops, there we go. There's our function. So here's what we're going to get. We end up getting a plus. Now, for our first one, we get the string length of one added on to full bar. And I'm going to use dot, dot, dot to represent the land function because I don't want to write all that. And um, our base case of zero. And then we have the list two, three. And then we end up in our second recursive application of full bar, we get, so we've already got string length of one with now adding, yes, I know I'm missing brackets. The string length of two being added to the length we get, whatever we get from calling our function on the list containing three. And then going down a little further, let's make this a little bit bigger here. There we go. So on our next recursive application of full bar, we end up with this. String length of three, added on to Hold R with our function and empty. Now, if we take this, we note that our base case gets applied in the last one, and so we're going to end up with this full bar turning into a zero. Ah. So now we can kind of see what's going on here. I'm adding the string length of three to zero. So if we were to actually evaluate this. Now I've left it as string lengths here. This would actually have been evaluated long in advance. So this would have been three, this would have been three, and then this one here would have actually been substituted into five long ago. I'm not following the substitution steps quite accurately. So now we would actually come and we would do plus three plus three five, that would be our next step, and then plus three, eight, and we would end up with 11. So what did function bar do? It takes a list of strings and computes what is the total number of characters in that entire list of strings, which in this case was 11. So remember, with fold R, we're following the simple recursion template we are going to expand it all out, and then when we start our final substitution steps, we are going to be combining the results from the right to the left. Okay. So, then we come to this topic of, can you do something more than producing just a singular number from full R? And the answer, of course, is yes. So we want to use fold R to produce another list. So what you have to think of here is what is the function going to do that you pass into fold R, and what is the base case going to be? So what we find is for most functions, the base case is going to be the empty list because we're creating a new list. So if you're creating a new list, what is the base case for simple recursion or our data definition? The base case is the empty list. So we have our base case. 
Now, what about our function itself? How would we combine this element with the results of the rest to create a list? You use cons. You take this element and you are causing it onto the results of doing something to the rest of the list. So since our base case is creating a list, we are causing something of this element onto the list. So we have a function here, negate list, which we had done before using map, and now we're going to do it using just old R. So here's what we've got. We've created a function, and it's going to cons this element. Remember x, the first argument to the function we passed to full R, is going to be an element of your list. And then this RROR, the second argument, that's the result of a recursive application on the rest of the list. Hence why we've called it RROR. Um, and so that itself is going to be a list. So what we're going to do then is we cons the negated x, which is our first, onto the results of negating the rest of the list. So there we go. Cons x negated x onto the results of the rest of the list. So then we're going to pass this as our function into fold r, our base case being empty, and there's the list. So it's pretty cool. And that does indeed produce a list. So let's actually look at that over here. So we have fold r and then we've passed it lambda x. I'm just going to use LST. I like to find doing full R and something that produces a list. I usually use LST so I know, hey, this is a list. So I'm cleansing the negated element onto the list. And our base case is empty. And let's do a simple one, one, three, five. So what this would give us in our first recursive application is cons of negative 1 onto fold r. I'm going to use dot, dot, dot for the function again. And then our base case of empty and 3, 5. So there's the first one. And then we would get cons of 1 onto cons negative 3. Fold r, empty. And then in the next recursive application of fold R, we would see that. And then finally, we get cons negative 1, cons negative 5. Oops. 5 onto empty. Ta-da! We just produced a list using full R. So since it's so easy to produce lists in using full R, you can imagine, of course, yes, indeed, as we showed you before, it's, a, it's totally possible to implement map and filter using just full R. So let's actually go back. And there's an implementation, by the way, of um, map in the uh, slides if you so choose to take a look at it and um, so there's the implementation of my map and then on slide 49 is how you implement um, map fold R of course we've also got the code for it here so let's actually go back and look at our implementations from before so here you've got map and what we're doing is kind of like negate list I want to apply some function to the first element of the list and cons that onto the results I get from the rest of the list. So if you look at map, my lambda, my function I pass into fold R, is going to cons applying the function onto the first item of our list. So we're applying function to item and consing that onto the results of the rest of the list. And our base case is empty. So it's just like negate list, except this time we've abstracted the function that we're actually applying to the elements of the list. Now filter again is a little different because I don't want a list that's the same size. 
So if you have map and you pass map and 10 element list, you get a 10 element list out of it. Maybe those items are a little bit more complicated. With filter, I pass it a 10 element list and I may get a 10 element list or I may get an empty list or I may get a list of two items because I'm only keeping the things in the list that actually have the predicate evaluated to true. So for using filter in Flint with Foldr, our Lambda function is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. So first off, the thing we want to know is we only want to keep items where the predicate evaluates to true. So that's exactly what we have here in this implementation. I have a con in my Lambda, and it says if the function, which is going to be the predicate, evaluates to true for the first item, then I cons the item onto the list. If, however, that function, that predicate we passed in, didn't evaluate to true for this item, you'll see here that I have an else case and I just produced the list. So I'm going to ignore item and it's not going to get added into the list. We've essentially taken a lot of the body of filter and shoved it into the full bar. So we now have three abstract list functions. You've got filter, you've got map, and you have foldr. And they're all built into Rocket, and they're very powerful, but the most powerful of all three is foldr, which can be used to even implement map and filter. Okay. So my advice for you moving towards Thursday's lecture is get some practice with foldr. See if you can figure out what the contract is and get some experience. Write some functions with Foldr that take a list of things and turn it into a singular result. Um, another thing you can do is create some functions with Foldr where you take a list and you produce a new list. So maybe implement a function like a Caesar cipher using Foldr. Um, maybe implement a function that converts all the letters in a list to uppercase only using Foldr. Try to do a bunch of sample problems with Foldr, and if I can find a few minutes, I'll try to post a few to Piazza as well. Okay, so then, that is all the material I want to cover today. Just to give you a heads up as to what's coming next class. Next class, we're going to be looking at two more abstract list functions. There's fold L, and then there's another one called build list, which actually lets you make a list, which is really cool. Uh, build list, by the way, is kind of like count down or count up. And then we are going to look at generative recursion. And then, so that's going to be the next class. And the remaining classes will be doing generative recursion and graphs. And hopefully a little bit more sample problems. All right then, with that, we'll see you on Thursday.